Thank you. And then, uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Gabby Olibanez, and again, I'm the Division Director for Forensic Diversion and Reintegration. And I am here to provide an overview, and I have two co-presenters. To my left, we have. Good afternoon, everyone. Rebecca Lemus, I'm a Program Manager 3, and I also work for the FDR Division. I oversee our community-based uh, contracts. I also oversee the uh, Behavioral Health Team at the Reentry Center. And I'll transition it over to Robin. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Robin Daniels Wilson. I'm also program manager three in the FDR division, and I oversee the collaborative courts and Evans Lane and the uh, the Jack List. So with that, we can go ahead and take story. Sure. Yeah. Go. Mm -hmm. All right, um, so let's just kind of review what our agenda is for this afternoon. Um, again, we'll provide you an overview. Um, we want to provide you some context around the behavioral health needs of this population. Um, our intercept model, which has really set the stage for collaboration and partnership. Um, program eligibility requirements. Uh, how do people access our services? And um, also, what are those access points within the system of care? Uh, we want to provide you an overview of the continuum of care, describe the services that we provide, which are evidence-based and are specific for justice and all populations. And also, um, we do tremendous work here with a small but mighty team. So we really wanna highlight the clients that we serve, uh, the grant-funded services that have come through our efforts, and also the program successes and additional resources. We were asked to provide additional resources to communities. So we want to be able to share all of that with you today. So, all right, so um, again, this is a population with great needs. Our behavioral health needs for the justice involved population are people uh, presently or who have spent time in the jails and prisons and experienced disappointingly higher rates of physical behavioral health diagnosis and are at higher risk for injury, death resulting from trauma, violence, overdose, suicide than people with no history of incarceration. Uh, people with behavioral health disorders are overrepresented in the criminal justice system. And as you guys know, uh, the jails and the prisons have become de facto mental health facilities, unfortunately. 51% uh, of people in prison, 71% of people in the US Jails have previously had a mental health disorder. 58% of people in the state prison, 63% of people in the US jails meet the criteria for drug dependence or abuse. Overdose deaths are 100 times more likely for justice involved individuals, two weeks post removed from the general population. And we, when we focus on California over the past decade, the proportion of incarcerated individuals in California jails with active mental health cases has risen by 63%. That's over 50%. Uh, California correctional health care systems experience drug overdose rate for incarcerated individuals are three times more than the national average. Among justice involved uh, individuals, two of three individuals incarcerated in California have a higher death and need for substance use disorder treatment. Next slide, please. There is hope at the end of the tunnel with anticipation of Cal AIM. Uh, justice involved populations will now, uh, through the booking process, be screened. They will find out if they have Medi-Cal. Uh, we're working very closely with adult custody health to develop those screening questions. What we find with this population is one, they lose their benefits, two, their benefits are in another county, and we really struggle to get them out and provide services in community. Um, and it's also quite a hindrance for our providers who cannot build Medi-Cal when the Medi-Cal is in other counties. Um, the other thing we'll have the ability to do now is 90-day release planning. Our providers graciously do this, go into the jails, uh, do release planning, but it's a non-billable service for us right now. 
Um, we will increase our behavioral health linkage. Um, we have currently a pilot for enhanced care management, which opens other opportunities for the justice involved population to receive ancillary services and care beyond behavioral health. Um, we'll continue to support people in community and transition them to our service providers. Next slide, please. So the forensic diversion and reintegration, um, what do we do? We divert individuals that have a mental health and a substance use disorder, and we provide early access to care and help them reintegrate into the community. Uh, we utilize evidence-based practices that reduce the jail population, and we preserve public safety. We're, we work very closely with our justice stakeholders, which is the public defender, the DA, the court system, um, you know, to find out what are the charges? Is there something that we should consider while placing this individual in community to ensure public safety and safety of our providers and our staff? Um, we do this by reducing recidivism, increasing connections to care, and enhanced fiscal savings. It is much cheaper to serve someone in community than keep them in the jail without treatment and services where they will further decompensate. Um, we also enhance the county's capacity for diversion and streamline cross-sectional collaboration. Uh, diversion is a legal process. We do mental health and substance use diversion. When someone can do treatment in lieu of receiving a felony or misdemeanor, that's a game changer for their life. You open opportunity for success and reintegration into community, and you avail these individuals to additional services. Um, we are stepping up initiatives uh, county, which it means um, that we are committed to reducing the jail population. We're committed to measuring our progress. We're committed to our stakeholders. And we're constantly evaluating our evidence-based practices and having conversation with our stakeholders. What worked, what didn't work, where should we improve? And we also do client focus groups. We really want to hear from the consumers. What was that moment that really changed things for you? What was helpful and, and what wasn't so helpful? What do we need to change to better improve access and care for you? Next slide, please. Um, our vision and guiding principles, I think, is important to share. Our vision is to ensure that our services support the justice needs of justice involved individuals with behavioral health needs. That includes co occurring disorders, mental health substance abuse disorders and intellectual disabilities uh, that will in turn lead to meaningful lives for these clients. Our guiding principles are to apply collaborative approaches as an effective method of serving justice involved populations, uh, to utilize data-driven outcomes. Many are, of our grants have been given to us and increased because the work that we do does show progress, does decrease recidivism, and people are exiting the jails and the, pri and the prisons in a more timely manner. Uh, we prioritize funding, um, which demonstrates, again, positive results. Prior to many of our initiatives, uh, somebody would be booked into the jail. It would almost take an average of 90 days to release them into community. Uh, thankfully today, because of the efforts of our stakeholders and our community-based organizations, uh, from booking to release, it's about 90 or 40 days. It used to be 90 days and now it's 40 days. So again, constantly looking at where we can make those improvements to do that quick inreach, that engagement. We use motivational interviewing. And then again, our assessment and then coordination out into community. Um, our mission statement, our mission is to spearhead and support treatment strategies that reduce the number of justice involved individuals with behavioral health conditions, including co-occurring, mental health, substance use, intellectual disabilities. And we want to pe steer people away from the justice system through comprehensive and appropriate diversion, treatment, and support services that facilitate reintegration back into community. Um, I also wanted to provide an org chart just to demonstrate um, who is assisting with all these services and what are the services uh, that we provide. I have the honor and pleasure of serving as the division director. And to my left and to my right, uh, Rebecca Limas and Robin House, Robin, who are the two powerhouses that help manage all these services with me. Um, 
I call them my dream team. This wouldn't be possible without our dream team. Uh, Rebecca is just the guru of all of our contracts and grants. Our reentry center uh, does the substance abuse treatment services there. Uh, Robin, our collaborative courts, Evans Lane, mental health diversion, drug diversion, and also specialized projects. Um, I won't get into all of the detail of this slide, but I just wanted to give you a quick overview again of the additional uh, support services. Um, we have contracts, evaluation, uh, RFP processes, uh, our Evans Lane program. Uh, you can see all the comprehensive services that they provide there, all of the diversion and the specialized projects. Um, again, won't go through that in detail, but you see the detail there of everything that's done. And we can send this out later so everybody can see specifically all the diversion programs and competent to stand trial. I could talk for hours about it. Um, the basis of um, the intercept model, which has really helped to design our services and it's used by a number of different communities to help organize behavioral health services and really to transform the system to ensure that people that are justice involved um, are helped through diversion activities. And what you do is you look at the whole intercept model. Um, and we'll go ahead and go to the next slide. And so I think our team, what we have done is through intercept zero all the way to five. Um, what we've really done is try to position ourselves through the intercept to make sure that those interventions are happening in a timely manner. Most of our work is done through intercept three when people are already booked into the jail. They're coming through us what we call the collaborative courts, which is department 60, 61, and 62. So most of our work happens there, but what we're kind of doing now is working backwards uh, where we want to have a presence before people actually get booked into the jail. So we're really looking at our comprehensive system of care. Where can we position ourselves? So one, people never come into the system. And two, if they're already into the system, how do we lead them out and give them the support and services from a holistic manner so that we can ensure successful integration um, in the community? We're gonna go ahead and move on. Um, we are part of the adult and older adult system of care. We're one of the divisions there. And um, what you have here before you is just our, our um, roadmap, where our strategies lie, um, what we're doing in terms of projects and outcomes, what are the impacts from a short-term perspective and long-term. Um, program eligibility, uh, who is eligible to come to us and receive services? Um, you have to be an adult, we only treat adults. 18 to 59, and then older adults, 60 and older, you have to be justice involved. This could be the first time you've been arrested. Um, you know, you don't have to have probation. You don't need to come from state parole. We do treat you, but maybe it's your first time arrest. You were, you know, discharged from the jail in 24 hours. We want to make sure that we have meaningful intervention so you don't keep going into the justice system. You have to have a substance, a mental health, or a co-occurring disorder. You have to be a resident of Santa Clara County and a Medi-Cal beneficiary. If you are not and you are considered what we call unsponsored, we do have unsponsored funding in our contract. We will still provide you care to ensure that you get the services that you need. Um, how do individuals access our services? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. So as, as, as Robin's kind of finding that slide, how do people access our services? Um, what we have, if someone, you know, becomes justice involved, we have what's called the collaborative courts. You're booked into the jail. We have specific clinicians that sit in departments 60, 61, and 62 who um, do screening and assessment. Uh, so if you're, you can travel through this court that deals with people that have mental health and substance use disorders. Um, the other way is maybe again, you weren't in the jail very long. It was, you know, your first time arrest. You can actually walk into our reentry center and ask to speak to a behavioral health clinician, or we will do a screening and an assessment. 
The other thing that we've set up to cast a wider net is what we call our mailbox. So um, anybody that works with our justice involved clients, probation, pretrial, state parole, um, a community provider that may be not part of our system, but has somebody that has become justice involved um, that can benefit from specific evidence-based practices and treatment for people that are justice involved can trigger a referral into our system. Um, the other thing that we've set up now is with emergency psychiatric service and our Barbara Aaron's Pavilion, should you land on a psych unit or at EPS and you need a referral, a referral can be triggered to us. So we can start that screening and engagement and ensure that you have a pathway to treatment upon release of those services. Um, this is just a workflow in terms of how people come to us that are in those courts that we just spoke about. Um, it's a judge to judge referral or the PDO and the DA with concurrence feel that this you know, case should be transferred to the collaborative courts. Maybe this person needs additional support services that may not do well just you know, at HOJ, Hall of Justice. Um, so that's just a quick workflow so you guys can see. And then our behavioral health team will start the screening and referral process. And then there's pathways to where you can go, either to an intensive mental health program, a co-occurring program, a substance use program, or maybe you only need medication ser support services and you have a psychiatrist there at the, the courthouse that can provide that. And then once we figure out where you need to go, then a warm handoff happens to our provider and our providers will also coordinate housing placements. Um, we feel it's incredibly important to not only give you treatment, but you need to be housed upon release of jail. Um, next slide. Um, this is the workflow for our reentry center. Um, someone just walks in. Again, maybe it's their first time arrest or they heard a friend got services there. Um, they walk in, they walk to the front desk and there is triaging that happens. And if an individual expresses need for behavioral health services, they're triaged over to our area. Um, a clinician looks up the information, there's discussions about what you need, there's connection to peer support, and then we do our screening, or maybe it's, a, it's an emergency situation and we have to do a 5150 and, and put you on a hold prior to coming to us. Now I'm gonna transition over to Rebecca Limas, who's gonna talk a bit more about our referral system. Thank you, Gabby. Um, so I think the great thing about our team is that we're always trying to find a way to process improve things. And so um, as Gabby mentioned, the reentry center uh, always took in walking clients. And so, um, you know, after various conversations with our providers, uh, the need for, uh, easier access or more immediate access uh, came up. And so uh, we uh, developed this referral form, which allows our providers and various other agencies to really make a referral uh, into the behavioral health system without having to have the client uh, commute or, or, or take the bus um, you know, from where they're at to the reentry center. So this is a, in addition to the walk-ins uh, at the reentry center, this is another a way to access services. Um, so we created the, the FDR electronic mailbox and the referral form. And as you can see, um, and we can send out a copy of this referral form, um, once there, a provider identifies that a client may potentially uh, have mental health or substance use uh, conditions, they'll send in a referral form. They'll also include an ROI, a release of information, and that will allow the provider to be able to uh, provide a dis, uh, information on the disposition as to where the client was referred to. Um, so once those referrals uh, and ROIs come in, they either can come in through BAP, EPS, um, our justice partners, probation, uh, parole, pretrial, adult, adult custody health. Um, also, um, our CBOs can also refer, uh, let's say that a client is open to a mental health clinic, uh, but they also need substance use treatment then they can also send in a referral to connect them to substance use. Um, and so once that referral is received uh, via the mailbox, we do have a clinician at the reentry center that processes these referrals. So they will look up the client, uh, they'll look up their benefits, they'll look up, uh, see if they have any uh, history in our system of care. 
Um, and if the client is already connected to a provider, then they will uh, in inform the referring party that they're already open and they'll communicate that information to our provider. Um, and if the individual is not connected, the, the clinician will then go ahead and contact the beneficiary. They'll go ahead and complete the, the phone screening and then they'll uh, determine level of care, whether it be mental health or substance use, and they will refer um, accordingly. Uh, next slide. Um, and then this is, uh, we've also developed an EPS and BAP protocol. Again, this is another one of our streamlining processes that we uh, you know, determined that there was a need for individuals that were not linked to behavioral health services that were accessing um, EPS or BAP um, to really connect them uh, rather than releasing them out into community without connection. Um, so if, uh, if an individual um, accesses EPS or BAP um, and they do uh, need to continue to uh, access services, they will uh, EPS and BAP staff will send in a referral, also via the mailbox, the same referral form that you saw um, in the previous slide. Uh, the B, uh, the reentry clinician will contact the client's assigned nurse at EPS or BAP or their case manager, and they'll coordinate a screening and referral with the individual while they're at, at EPS or BAP. Um, during the um, uh, initial conversation and introduction, EPS will provide the clinician that's doing the screening and the referral with information in terms of like uh, their medication, you know, how they're doing in treatment um, and, and uh, any other clinical appropriate information. Uh, and then once the clinician completes the telephone screening with the client over the phone, they'll uh, conduct a, cl a clinical needs screening and determine whether they need substance use or mental health treatment. Um, if the individual uh, is in need of mental health services um, in the IJS, uh, an integrated justice service screening tool is completed, and then they're referred into a behavioral health uh, forensic diversion and reintegration system of care. Um, if the individual is in need of substance use treatment, an IST is completed, and then they will be referred to a substance use program. Um, the EPS and the BAP nurse uh, or the case manager and the client will be uh, will provide the client with information regarding the program that they're being referred to, and they'll provide them with the, the name of the agency, the phone number, um, the address, uh, so that they can make sure to follow up with the client. Um, if a uh, determination is made that the client needs additional RRC uh, services, so the Reentry Resource Center has adjunct services um, that potentially the individual may benefit from. So if that's the case, um, the uh, BAP and EPS uh, staff will also provide them with information uh, for the reentry center so that once they get released from EPS or BAP, they can walk in to the reentry center to access those services. Um, also, if the individual is released from EPS or BAP, which uh, that's also another one of our uh, processes that we're working on, um, if they're released after 5 p.m., which is after hours, um, they can uh, send over. Uh, a referral form, the reentry center will process that referral form the next day. Uh, but if not, the client will also be giving the information for the reentry center so that they can walk in and uh, get a screening and referral done. Um, and then just lastly, in terms of EPS or BAP, um, uh, once, once the referral has been completed, uh, they'll go ahead and send them to the appropriate uh, program. Um, and then, uh, uh, they'll, they'll just uh, contact the provider and let them know that the client is at EPS, that the client will need follow-up, and they'll coordinate uh, to make sure that uh, that coordination, that linkage is made between EPS and the provider. Next slide. And then uh, just a, a bit of a program overview. Um, this is our uh, kind of an overview of our continuum of care for the Forensic Diversion and Reintegration Division. Um, as you can see, uh, the first bubble is the acute uh, system of care, which is EPS, BAP, uh, acute inpatient. And uh, as previously mentioned, once an individual accesses these services, they would go through the CJS mailbox. The next uh, bubble there is the crisis, uh, and that includes crisis stabilization and crisis residential. Then we have intensive outpatient, which includes intensive outpatient, 
full service partnership and our forensic assertive community treatment program. Um, and then the next one is outpatient. And these are um, based on highest uh, need uh, to lowest. Um, the next one is outpatient, and that includes aftercare, PRCS, co-occurring events lane, and the reentry substance use outpatient program. Um, and then we also have community support services. Uh, we had our faith-based services. Uh, they have, uh, as of December 31st, they transitioned over to the Office of Reentry Services, so they are no longer part of the Behavioral Health Department. Um, but they uh, do also continue to provide support services if needed, if the, an individual needs clothing, um, you know, maybe one time uh, uh, connection to a, a shelter or a, a, a homeless shelter or, or any other type of immediate uh, housing, they will assist with that. And then we also have our transitional housing units um, and then in custody services, we have our STEP program, which screens and refers individuals into substance use treatment. And I'm not gonna go into detail um, on all this, um, but this is uh, just really an overview of all of our various services that I just went over, um, as you see. Um, and again, this is based on the highest acuity need. And the first one is crisis residential, which we have our, uh, our partners here in the room. Um, and this really is kind of a step down uh, for individuals that are um, on the verge of being in crisis, but they're not on a, they're not uh, 5150, but they do need that additional stabilization. Um, then we have our forensic assertive community treatment program, which is our highest level FSP service. Um, and they do, um, the, the unique thing about our FACT program is they do community, uh, they provide community services. So the, even the psychiatrist can go out there to provide medication to the individual. Um, and they also have um, substance use counselors, they have employment uh, counselors, they have uh, various uh, unique uh, 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 positions that, that help really provide a client with all the, the needs that they need as they transition into community. And then we have the intensive outpatient program, which our partners are here as well. Um, and they also provide um, services for 90 days for individuals that are often transitioning from, from custody. We also have FSP services. Uh, we have Evan Slane. Um, we have our Evan Slane team here also uh, representing. Um, we have our co-occurring outpatient programs that we have aftercare in our PRCS. Uh, program. Next slide, please. Um, and then um, to, this is just kind of an overview of, of the specialized services that are provided by our partners. And uh, on the top, you'll see um, that um, our programs are really client centered and uh, they provide outreach and en engagement while the individual's in custody as well as while they're in community. Um, they also uh, coordinate with the courts, with the jails, uh, with the justice partners to really make sure that the individual um, is receiving the support uh, that they need to really navigate the justice system as well as the behavioral health system. Um, they also provide client status reports. And these are reports that they provide the, uh, the court or their supervising officer on how the individual is doing clinically. Um, and then we also have infused in all of our programs flex funding, um, and that really helps the individuals. Um, it helps them support them with um, as they're transitioning out of custody with those felt needs that they might not have access to, uh, such as clothing, food. Um, also, uh, we do assist with housing. So some of those flex funds are used for housing or a large portion of them are used for, for housing support. Um, also, uh, our providers support clients during court dates, so they will go to court with the client and they'll provide support, they'll provide an update on how the individual is doing, um, and they really are there to, to make the client feel like there's somebody there to really advocate if, if need be. Um, and then all of our services are evidence-based and they're really targeted uh, to uh, focus uh, on the justice navigation, um, on criminal thinking, and various other uh, evidence evidence based practices that are tailored to our justice population. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then these are some of the therapeutic approaches that we uh, utilize. Uh, the trauma informed. I'm sure a lot of you all 
are aware of a lot of these. Uh, Trauma-informed therapy, relapse prevention, life skills, cognitive behavioral therapy, wellness and recovery model, criminal thinking, seeking safety, um, and motivational interviewing. Um, next slide. And then uh, this slide just, I'm not gonna go into it. It's, uh, it's really busy, but this is our uh, decision tree. And we really developed this to try to help our court assessors and our um, reentry uh, clinicians determine what the best level of care would be for the individual based on the clinical history and their presentation. And so um, from top to bottom would be the crisis residential. And then on the bottom would be the IHOP team. And I will transition it over to Robin. So before we transition to Robin, I think there was a question in the chat. And then I wanted to know if anybody here has any questions. No? OK. Oh, go ahead. So um, it was mentioned that um, I'm just going to use the acronym FDRD um, will enhance the county's capacity um, to like streamline um, people into services. Um, how does the program plan to do that, like with a system that's already highly impacted and um, understaffed contract and, and like utilizing understaffed contractors? So I think what we've been looking at is different funding opportunities to be able to expand capacity. Um, I think it's kind of out of necessity that we started to write grants. So one is through our grant funding program or contract amendment process, where we actively meet with our providers every month to look at their service, their utilization, how many clients they're serving, do they have unspent funding so we can uptick and build out more capacity. And then again, through MHSA going after uh, that funding stream to request uh, funds to build out capacity and also through AB 109. So we're constantly looking at our funding streams and then the overall county budget um, where if we have services that are procured, like for instance, we had, a, we had a contract as a vendor, we're not utilizing that contract. So we're gonna bring that back in house and look at other opportunities and how to best extend that. So from a fiscal standpoint, I think we're always looking at that from a utilization standpoint. And then through the work that we do with our partners, that constant communication of what is still needed and where is it that we have inefficiencies in our process where we can cut that out and look at more efficient ways to streamline it and bring back more services and support our um, providers. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think the other thing too is that we um, need on a monthly basis with our providers just to really look at, you know, what's working, what's not working, like, you know, what, what are the challenges that they're facing? What are the things that uh, are really successful? Um, and then we have those conversations to really look at how do we um, improve our system of care? How do we create, you know, more throughput? How do we uh, increase capacity? And we, and we really use that um, when we look at the renewal season every every year and to see just exactly what Gabby says uh, said about you know where do we make modifications to our contracts so that's the other thing that we're constantly looking at I'm sorry I have one more thing because we do do grants we have to bring in independent evaluators and they have to evaluate our programs to see if they are working so there's specific metrics that we have to comply with um, and if we don't comply with those, then we potentially lose our funding. Mm -hmm. So it's bringing in that independent evaluator that has conversations with our clients, our providers, and then really helps us to understand the, the data and the metrics if we met those metrics. And then through our work and contract with the Department of State Hospitals, what we have to do is we have to provide a, a roster of everybody that we're serving. And then that client roster, and we have you know permissions to do that uh, is also transferred over to the district attorney's office. And what they look at is when that person with us, when we're diverting them, we're trying to get them off that felony and that misdemeanor, did they commit any new charges? And so if they did, obviously we were not successful. But I have to say Monday, we actually got notice that we're receiving an additional $500,000 because we have been successful. So 
when you work with government, there's many factors to consider. And I think more recent, we're overlaying that independent evaluator. You know, it does that person does not work for us. So they can really tell us like this work, this didn't work, and here's where you make modifications. Or, you know, you really need to steer your programs in a different direction. So thank you. That's important. I mean that like outside. Well, and I think because they don't work inside, you know, there's no biases, and we can really hear from their perspective, from an analytical perspective, mm -hmm. and they can really show us the metrics that work and where we need to make our investment. So, thank you. Um, I have one more thing. Uh, so um, I'm with the uh, assisted outpatient treatment with the county, and um, I was just wondering if we would be able to um, make those referrals. Um, to um, your program, are, we, are we able yeah, to do we, that? We, yeah, we can definitely have conversations. We actually work uh, in with the county, our counterpart that um, runs that program from the county side. We work very closely with them. So yeah, we would definitely welcome those conversations. Actually, we refer people from the jail there as well, mm -hmm. who for you know whatever reason just you know maybe uh, you know diversion just wasn't the right fit for them this time. Mm -hmm. So we do make those referrals. So we could have discussion about bi-directional referral and how to work closer. Since we're really supporting all these clients, right? They're just in different phases of their treatment and the support that they need. Thank you. Great questions. Thank you so much for asking. Any other questions? There was a question in the chat that was asked a while back. It might've been on Zoom, but it was when you were on the EPS BAP slide. And it was, do any of these programs provide mental health sets or just mental health? So in co-occurring, um, we have a co-occurring outpatient and Robin will get into this later in her presentation, but our Evans Lane program is act, actually just submitted the waiver to be able to do substance use. They do mental health. So that'll be a co-occurring program as well. That was it for the questions. Thank you. I don't see any virtual hands up. So Robin, thank you. Sure. I'll continue on. Okay. All right. So the behavioral health treatment court is a specialized calendar that uses a problem solving model to assist defendants with mental health, substance use, and co-occurring disorders. And these cases are heard at the Family Justice Center in Department 61. And there's also special calendars for veterans and for individuals with traumatic brain injuries or intellectual disabilities. And the goals of the, the Behavioral Health Treatment Court team is to support clients return to society, reduce recidivism, increase public safety, and improve their participants' quality of life. And the Behavioral Health Treatment Court staff will conduct screenings using motivational counseling. So sometimes they'll be meeting the client in custody or in court to try to motivate them to take their medications or to keep coming to court. Um, they'll explain what participation means um, and they'll help coordinate care with our community providers and prepare the clients for their court appearances, monitor their adherence to the court requirements and develop transition plans. Uh, the mental health um, um, Mental Health Diversion Track 1 is one of our tracks, and Mental Health Diversion allows individuals with felonies and misdemeanors uh, to be diverted from entering and re-entering the criminal justice system, and they must have a mental health disorder, and some diagnoses are excluded. The, their mental health disorder must have been um, a factor in the commission of their offense or nexus, part of the reason why they committed that offense. And the symptoms would respond to treatment and the client doesn't impose a risk to society. Now that um, PC uh, Penal Code um, 1001 has just recently been amended this last year. And what, it's, what it will do is no longer will nexus need to be proven. And so just if the client has a mental health disorder, they can um, uh, get mental health diversion track one. We see about 100 clients in mental health track diversion mental health track one diversion a year. And their diversion is for one year. And then next slide, are we on track two? Track two, um, the community-based treatment for incompetent to stand trial felonies. These clients um, uh, are incompetent to stand trial and when they are deemed or declared to have mental, um, um, when they, um, uh, their, when doubt is declared as to their mental competency, competency in court, uh, all criminal proceedings stop. 
And at that point, um, the court makes a determination if the person is going to go to the state hospital or if they can participate in community-based treatment services. At that point, our behavioral health services team will work collaboratively with the public defender, with the DA, and determine um, wh what is the appropriate level of care in the community and can we meet this person's needs. And these cases are then uh, referred uh, to uh, 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 the court team and they will develop a treatment plan and work to release the client uh, into treatment. And by contrast, if a person um, is goes to the Department of State Hospitals, um, they will wait in custody about six months until the a bed becomes available. And so if they are granted track to diversion, it will lead to a quicker release time from jail and it will expedite the connection to community-based treatment programs. Um, and this is typically for about two years in track two diversion. And then track three, next slide, there you go, thank you. Um, in January, 2022, um, the misdemeanor competency process was identical to the felony IST process. And clients would stay in jail for a long time. And, and usually misdemeanor um, charges are usually last about a year. And so a lot of times they'd be waiting in jail for, um, uh, you know, uh, the court to happen and they would time out. And a lot of times these clients would be released to the community without any service connection. And so the court, the district attorney, the public defender uh, and behavioral health um, helped to streamline that process. And so we now have a process where upon declaration of doubt for these misdemeanor cases, they're sent immediately over to the mental health treatment court um, and they begin encouraging the clients to take medications earlier uh, and working with an assessment and finding a safe release plan. And this has reduced the amount of time that misdemeanor cases um, are in custody um, when they're in competent to stand trial. And the recent changes to that law too, that was changed, uh, that modified this, also allowed the courts to be able to refer these clients to treatment it allowed them to go to AOT, and, um, and so, uh, and, and it also allows the court to refer these clients to conservatorship investigation um, or fair court, which hasn't been established yet in this county. So there's other options now that they're looking at to try to help serve these folks. Slide. Uh, we also have a wellness a dependency wellness court. And this court works in collaboration with social service agencies and parent advocates to assist parents in achieving and maintaining sobriety and reunifying with their children. And their goals for the children is to reduce the use of foster care and increase family reunification, improve child safety and well being. And the goals for the parents are to um, provide prompt access to substance use and mental health treatment services and to connect. Uh, participants to uh, support services in the community and to promote self-sufficiency uh, and social connectedness. And then the last court uh, I want to talk about is the um, ac accountability, recovery, and community calendar. It's an art calendar. It's a free plea calendar out of Department 62. And in this calendar, individuals that are willing to engage in treatment um, and recovery and be, will begin a six month period of court reviews and monitoring um, or monitoring of their treatment. And once they've completed this period, there um, there's no law violation and the case is dismissed. And in the first year of the ARC pilot, approximately 70 cases were diverted and over 80% of the individuals have either graduated or engaged in treatment and, and are in good standing. And, and since the end of 2021, more than 600 cases have been referred to Department 62. And the DA and the public defender are motivated to increase the number served in this program if we can get additional behavioral health services department staffing. Um, next, next one, next is Evans Lane. So I'm going to talk about Evans Lane. Evans Lane is a 56 bed residential and outpatient clinic that serves the justice involved population. 
Uh, Evans Lane is committed to providing effective and innovative alternatives to our uh, incarceration. And the mission is achieved by the delivery of quality evidence-based services. Evans Lane Wellness and Recovery Program provides uh, a balance of client education, behavioral health treatment, competency development, and accountability practices. Um, and services are provided through the lens of deinstitutionalization and increasing personal agency. So, um, but it's Evans Lane Residential Program is a 24-7 facility. Um, it's a co-ed facility serving male, female, and gender expansive clients. Uh, there are 14 apartments. Um, there are 14 two-bedroom and 14 two-bedroom, one-bedroom apartments, including one ADA approved apartment. So there's basically for each apartment, there's four clients and then two clients per room. The length of stay for Evans Lane Residential is up to one year, and it's an ind independent living program. We have an outpatient program um, that provides specialty mental health services. And, uh, and clients can be co-housed. They can, you know, if they're enrolled in Evans Lane outpatient, they can also be co-housed in the residential program. Um, and then also um, our, um, uh, and then the length of stay is one year as well. And our dosage is four hours per month. So the services that are available through outpatient are case management, psychiatry, individual and group therapy, um, individual and group rehabilitation. There's uh, NA and AA meetings and medication support. And on the residential side, we have similar services. We have AA and NA meetings, medication support, one-on-one -on -one case uh, reviews. They have for three meals a day. And there's a community investment program and structured program designed to mirror uh, expectations of community-based living. And we receive referrals for um, the outpatient program through the Rancher Resource Center, behavioral health team, parole, probation, support, CASU, and uh, community-based organizations to transfers. And on the residential side, all of our FDR programs um, are the, the outpatient programs that can refer into Evans Lane Residential. Um, and then to live at Evans Lane Residential, a client must be connected to one of the mental health providers in our FDR division. And our referral criteria. So our client population is 21 years and older um, and in the outpatient 18 years and older. Um, they must have a diagnosis that meets medical necessity. Um, they have to have Santa Clara County Medi-Cal uh, and a typical level of care more score is five to seven. They of course need to be involved in the, the justice system. Um, there are some criminal histories that are exclusions, like for instance, arson might be an exclusion um, and other charges um, and substance abuse history. So our clients, um, definitely there's a high number of clients that have co-occurring disorders and um, we, we can accept clients with co-occurring disorders, but if they need a higher level of care for like say instance, they need to go to detox or residential, we're gonna do an upgrade into the set side of the programs. Um, and then they, they are, they are able to, um, you know, maintain in their outpatient program, but if they need a higher level of care, as far as residential goes, and it's not a, a primary substance abuse residential. Program. All right. And then, um, you know, we've just had some recent facility upgrades and this shows a picture of our, um, our, one of our therapy, our therapy room and our community room. Okay. And then there's our contact information for our program managers uh, for this facility. Um, we keep going. And then highlights and successes. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna share some demographics. Um, and uh, you know, just this really just showcases the importance of our work and, and the need for our services. As you can see, 44% of 
uh, people that are in jails have a serious mental illness. Um, and uh, as you see the top uh, area, it talks about the jail census uh, compared to the justice involved population with SMI and the number of individuals that are on the jail assessment coordination list that are uh, scheduled to be released from custody into community. Um, and so if you look at uh, 2020, uh, there was 3,838 individuals that were on the jail uh, census. Uh, 1,689 of those individuals had an SMI or severe mental illness. Um, and 1,617, so pretty much all of the individuals uh, identified with an SMI um, were placed on the JAC list and referred into one of our uh, FDR programs. Um, I'm just going to go over the 2020 statistics. Um, in uh, 2020, there was 2,608 individuals that were in custody. Of those, 1,148 uh, were identified as having a, a SMI, and 1,086 individuals were placed on the jail assessment coordination list and were placed into our FDR programs. Um, looking down at the um, graphs on the bottom, uh, in terms of gender, our highest uh, gender that is in custody is males at 72%, followed by 23% of females and 5% uh, of individuals identifying as other. Um, in terms of age, uh, our highest uh, age range is, is that uh, between 25 and 34 years of age, um, and then followed by 45 to 64 years of age. Um, and then 28% 20, um, uh, is between the age of 35 and 44. 6%, uh, which is uh, one of our lower uh, age ranges, is between the age of 18 to 25, so our K population. Um, and then in terms of the ethnic background, um, you'll see that the highest ethnic uh, population accessing our jails is uh, white or Caucasian at 34%. Uh, followed by Hispanic and Latino, 29%, uh, and then the third uh, being African American at 19%. And then in terms of our languages, um, the highest uh, language uh, spoken uh, of our um, justice involved population is English at 95.5%, and then the, the next one would be Spanish at 3.2%, followed by uh, Vietnamese at 1.1%. Next slide. Um, and, and this, the prior st statistics only really showcase those individuals that are on the jail assessment coordination list that are uh, being released from custody into programming that have been screened and referred by the collaborative court team. Um, this uh, next statistics really showcase because we do have other access portals that individuals are being screened and referred in custody, either through the reentry center or our step program. And so um, in FY22, uh, our, we, our division, our FDR division served 2,088 undisputed clients. And these are individuals that are only counted once. Um, and of those individuals, there was 3,571 encounters, um, meaning that there was uh, various uh, admissions into the FDR system of care during that fiscal year. Slide. And then this is just kind of a, a, a graphic of um, the various programs that our clients are accessing in the, in the numbers uh, based on the level of care. I won't go through all of these, but just uh, going from highest intensity to lowest, uh, our crisis residential program um, served 333 unduplicated clients with 453 encounters. Our first, um, our program that act uh, clients access the most is our FSP program with 627 uh, clients, um, unduplicated clients accessing services in FY22 uh, with 789 encounters. And as previously mentioned, crisis residential is the second highest access uh, program. Um, our faith-based program, um, it's not a clinical service. Um, and at the time when it was still under FDR, uh, actually did uh, see 670 clients um, that were accessing either felt needs or case management services with 719 encounters. Next slide. 
And then just to, to kind of reiterate what Gabby had talked about, that you know we, we're continuously looking at ways to increase our capacity, to increase and improve our services. We did apply for the Prop 47 grant, um, and on July 26th of last year, the Board of State and Community Corrections notified us that we did receive that grant. So um, we did work um, uh, between September and December, we worked on really um, uh, getting all those services up and running. And so um, as of February 16th, our co-occurring program, which now um, is able to provide 50 co-occurring slots and 30 transitional housing units has started to take clients. So um, that was one of the grants that we've received recently. Um, we also received a, a grant from the Department of State Hospitals. Um, and we uh, became the lead agency who is responsible for diverting adults and older adult clients with severe and persistent mental health and co-occurring conditions. And this is the, the team that Robin um, really screens and refers into. Um, we uh, did receive this additional funding uh, as kind of a, a way to reduce the number of mentally ill individuals in custody and provide them with supportive treatment environments which will focus on facilitating longstanding reintegration into community. Next slide. And then uh, just recently, uh, we applied for the CHAPA grant um, and uh, we were notified January 26th that we were awarded that grant and that's in the amount of $2 million. And so what we will be doing with that funding is we will be purchasing a home um, that will uh, be then converted into transitional housing program and uh, will allow our outpatient programs to be able to house our clients. Um, so we're currently working on, on uh, that process and purchasing a home, identifying one. And um, once that's up and running, we'll let our providers know so that they can uh, start referring individuals. Next slide. And then um, just in terms of client successes, this, you know, I think one of the things that, um, you know, that really drives us on a day-to-day -day basis to, to really do the work that we're doing um, is, is the client success stories that we hear from our providers. Um, you know, we don't often hear that because we're kind of working on developing programs, you know, uh, overseeing how programs are doing. So um, these are some of the client success stories that our providers have shared with us. Um, and the first one is uh, in terms of uh, our intensive outpatient program, um, they identified an, an adult female in her 30s who was arrested for stabbing her parents in their sleep. Um, she was referred to treatment from Judge Manley's court, um, but still was unwilling to answer questions for assessments and routinely presented as hostile and irritable. Um, she was then linked to sober and living environments and provided intensive case management services and offered medication management. Um, once she uh, got into treatment and uh, became adherent to, to the treatment, she obtained a part-time job while in treatment and began paying for her own rent. And so now she's graduated to a lower level of care after she stabilized. So that's an example of the great work that our providers do in our programs. Uh, to really help our clients transition and, and uh, reintegrate into community. The next one is, uh, the next example is an intensive treatment and support. Uh, and this is a homeless Latino gang dropout that he was in the age of 40. He was incarcerated for most of his life, diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder, amphetamine use disorder, and cannabis use. Um, he had a long history of substance use treatment, uh, but minimal mental health treatment despite, despite uh, having six suicide attempts and 15 EPS or emergency admissions. Um, he was referred to the mental health diversion after facing a third strike prison sentence with charges of felony residential burglary. Um, and he was linked to crisis residential in fact uh, for housing at, at the fact house um, and was provided with intensive case management, medication services, and individual and group therapy. Um, the providers helped support him to remove tattoos. He attended weekly AA meetings, attended court. Um, he got his driver's license. Uh, he, uh, he bought a car and applied for jobs, and he is up for graduation from the courts. 
Um, and also our faith-based services. Um, this is someone who uh, we've heard him speak and has really um, has has really made me at, at least maybe really motivated me to continue to do the work that I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and he, uh, he's an older uh, male African American who uh, served over 26 years of incarceration. Um, he had a destructive lifestyle with history of gang activity and drug use. He was a, a three striker facing a life sentence and was released under uh, PRCS. He was referred to the faith-based centers and was homeless when he was released from, from prison. Um, he received assistance and placement in the THU and was sent to case management for peer support. Um, then he was provided with assistance um, with anger management and drug addiction. Um, he learned life skills uh, connected to a men's group and encouragement in furthering education. Um, since then, he did go on to get his KDAC. He graduated. He's now an ordained minister, mm -hmm. and he travels the United States promoting prison reform. So um, that's one of, uh, one of the success stories for our faith-based uh, programs. And then lastly, the substance use treatment services. Uh, this is an adult male on probation with a history of amphetamine abuse, chronic homelessness, and incarceration. Um, he was enrolled in addiction treatment and placed in a recovery residence for stable housing. He obtained a bus uh, pass from the program gained and maintained full-time employment, uh, successfully completed his treatment plan and became assistant house uh, manager for one of the recovery residents um, and has worked towards a personal goal of uh, obtaining a car. So um, just some of the success stories um, that really showcase how individuals have, what their journey is from the time that they were released from custody uh, throughout the time that they reintegrated successfully into community. I know we're at two o'clock. Yeah. Uh, did you want us to, why don't you, well, how many more slides? We have a few more, so okay. I'm wondering if we should just stop here. Uh, I'm okay, people here okay? Um, we're recording it so that for people who have to leave, we can. Okay. People can do it. So yeah, I would love to okay. hear the rest Thank of you. Okay. And then just the, the last slide is the highlights and successes for the MHSA community convening meeting on diversion. So we uh, did facilitate a convening meeting that Gabby and uh, one of our public defenders uh, facilitated. Um, and that was really to gather recommendations on diversion to increase access to treatment and decrease time spent in carceral settings. And with that, I'll transition it over to, I believe it's Robert. Um, so one of the, th the changes that's gonna be happening is that um, to, I think I mentioned this earlier, but to mental health diversion track one is that um, they expect about 50% more cases will be coming in as track one as that law changed. Um, so that's that's excellent news for our clients. And um, and diversion uh, results in improved health for our clients and diminished social costs for judicial costs and jail costs um, and processing um, these offenses. Uh, and some of our other highlights this year has been uh, having our staff do co-occurring assessments, reducing the need to have multiple assessments. Um, so we're cross-training our staff to make that process a little bit easier and have uh, one, one screening and referral, you know, or maybe referral to two programs, but have one person doing the assessment. Sorry. Um, and so some of the Evans Lane successes is we uh, piloted a program with the Office of the Sheriff and their CASU uh, electronic monitoring program. And so we've been having clients go directly from custody to community through Evans Lane program. We also have a pilot with the mental health diversion um, court clients. Uh, we're piloting those, those clients at Evans Lane and providing wraparound services to those clients. And we have increased, um, in 2022, our referrals increased 100%. And, um, and, um, and we've had uh, a successful response to COVID. We were um, very early got our license to administer antigen and PCR tests to make sure that our clients are safe in residential settings. 
We've had upgrades to our security system, and then we are weeks away from finishing getting our SUTS waiver to be able to offer mental health services and SUTS services in one location. Um, and just quickly, there is a lot that's always happening um, with the version, the law changes, programmatic changes. Also, we do a lot of research because this is a forensic-based program and treatment services. Um, so we do offer now a newsletter. So it is on our SharePoint. So we're happy to share information and research articles um, that have you know, proven successes for this population. So there's our SharePoint link if you uh, want to read and find out what we're doing in terms of our initiatives. Um, and just additional resources. Um, this is a resource page that we brought. So we're happy to share this with any of our external partners. Um, a lot of times I just get questions on like, you know, my loved one's in jail, what do I do? I don't know where their court date is. I don't know what support service is. So this is just information to share with everybody. Um, so we brought some of those and we can also uh, send the link out and, you know, we can share it. Uh, I'll send it out via email. email. Yeah. Um, and so this is just kind of our mantra. We wanna thank you for the opportunity to present on our services, our programs and our client successes. Again, like Rebecca said, that's really what drives us is when people can successfully, you know, leave a jail, a prison and integrate back into community and be productive citizens. Um, so I just wanna read this to you. This is really what I think has grounded us in the version. And it, what it says is we are all implicated when we allow other people to be mistreated. An absence of compassion can corrupt the decency of a community, a state, and a nation. Fear and anger can make us vindictive and abusive, unjust and unfair, until we all suffer from the absence of mercy and we condemn ourselves as much as we victimize others. The closer we get to mass incarceration and extreme levels of punishment, the more I believe it's necessary to recognize that we all need mercy, we all need justice, and perhaps we all need some measure of unmerited grace. Um, that's from Brian Stevenson, Just Mercy, A Story of Justice and Redemption. If you haven't read his book or seen his story or his YouTubes, I'd really encourage you to. And again, uh, thank you for your, participata your participation today and for allowing us to share uh, information about our programs, our services, and our clients. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Any final questions for our panel? Okay, well, well thank you all and uh, for being here. And thank you for our virtual uh, participants. I know there's still quite a few of us on there. We have our next one will be on April uh, 12th, I believe, and it's going to be on our uh, mobile crisis programs and our trust program as well, too. So thank you all for being here. We really appreciate it. Um, great presentation. I learned new stuff, and I've been in our department for several years, so thank you so much. And I really love the success story, so it's like amazing and just a wealth of information. I think you could have spent another hour just going over all your stuff. So thank you so much, and thank you all, and you all have a safe and uh, weekend. I know we're going to have some wet days coming up, so everyone's doing safe. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.